and here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is the talk show Hell Hates. And the more you listen, the more you know why this is Pastor Mike online. Online with a new microphone. And I have no idea where it came from. I don't. I have no idea. Um, I mentioned Thursday during Thursday's PMO. It's awfully white, isn't it? It's like glowing. Anyway, uh, during Thursday's talk show, Hell Hates, Hell Hated My Microphone. So, like just getting into PMO and it started going out. So, and I was doing some recording earlier that day and I could tell something went right with it. So anyway, I make a re I asked you folks last Thursday for a recommendation. Well, apparently somebody recommends this one. And it is a let me get the box here. It is a road R O D E podcaster broadcast quality USB microphone. Um, and it is from Australia. Uh, now, I I ordered a microphone. It's supposed to come in today. Uh, this one came in yesterday. So, I'm going to try them out. And uh, one will be uh, in service. One will be a backup. So whoever sent this, I mucho apreciado. Pardon my French. Speaking of French, Cathedral de la Notre Dame. That's like, pardon my French and my Spanish at the same time. Burnt almost to the ground yesterday. And you know what? Now you say you're being mean. Nobody, to my knowledge, got hurt. So I am thankful for that. But an 800-year-old Catholic church burning to the ground? I'm not mourning the loss of that. Now, it did not eliminate the Catholic church. And, you know, here's what's interesting is that they've already uh, just within 24 hours of this thing happening, uh, you have wealthy billionaires all over the world that are donating, and I mean donating. You've got about four or five donors c coughing up a half a billion dollars already to rebuild the Cathedral of Notre Dame in France. And n number one, if anything were to happen to Bethel Church, God forbid. But if anything were, if if our church caught on fire, I guarantee you it would we would not require a half a billion dollars to rebuild it. Now that is to say, I don't know how much this microphone cost. Could be, but anyway. Um, there is, and I didn't really have a chance to look into this today. I've, I've been kind of looking into some other things. But there is scripture where you take like Hezekiah and Josiah. These kings that when they came into power, they immediately went to work burning down all of the groves, cutting up all the idols, destroying the remnants of Baal and Ashtaroth and idolatry. So it does not surprise me that this church burns down, burns up all of its icons, its images. Now they're talking about some heroic Catholic priest. That's a mouthful there. Uh, going in and saving all these religious relics. And, you know, they're praising him as a hero. And he saved all these, you know, these old religious. I, these are things you got to understand this. These are things that people bowed down to. Like the Shroud of Turin. They bring the Shroud of Turin out every so many years. And people, Catholics come from all over the world 
to bow down to this thing. It's an image of a dead guy. Now, I don't know. I do I do not believe that the Shroud of Turin is in any way connected to the actual burial shroud of Jesus Christ because scripture because the Bible tells us that the body of Christ was wrapped in a separate shroud than the head was and both of them were laid folded up you know, in the tomb on Resurrection Day. So I do not believe that one single cloth covered the entire head and body of Jesus Christ. Much less do I believe, and I used to believe this back in my younger and my foolish days. I used to believe it. That there was, you know, this burial shroud has the image of Jesus Christ on it. It bears the image of a man that was crucified. So anyway, uh, Da Vinci could very well have manufactured this thing using what's called in technology available at, at his, in fact, technology that we know that he used called a camera obscura. And the image on the shroud could very well be da Vinci's own face. Kind of looks like him. In fact, you never saw da Vinci and Jesus in the same room together. Okay? Never happened. But anyway, uh, they they worship this, this piece of cloth as if it were Jesus himself. And so these religious relics, whatever they had inside the Cathedral of Notre Dame, this Catholic priest saves them. Do you know why? Well, number one, they're probably worth millions of euros. Number two, this is the only God that they have. And I mean that. This is the only God that they have. They, they'll, they'll have dead men's bones. They'll bring out some dead, quote unquote, saint. Every so many years. And Roman Catholics from all over the world will come and will bow down and will worship and they will pray to some dead person's bones or maybe uh, the, the burial cloth or maybe, you know, some shirt that some nun wore a hundred years ago or whatever. They'll pull these out. And people will come and pray because they think that that's their God. That's who they pray to. They'll want to touch it as if touching it, you know, will release like God energy to them or something like that. I mean, it's crazy. What Roman Catholics, and I, I don't hate Roman Catholics, I love them. But God expressly for it is forbidden. I'll say it is it did God expressly forbode, forbade, forbidden? I have to go back and learn that one. But God said you don't do that. You don't have an image. God said, you did not see me at Mount Sinai. You do not know what I look like. Therefore, you cannot have an image of me, period. The only image of God allowed is God's son, Jesus Christ. His living, visible presence of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that bears the, the true image of God our Father. So to worship anything less than that is to worship an idol. And God said, don't do that. And I would just, I would reach out to Roman Catholics as I would to Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, liberals, doesn't matter. And I would give them scriptures and say, in fact, I did this with a Catholic woman in Dallas, Texas. I said, ma'am, next time you go into your Catholic church, I want you to repeat this verse in your mind. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not bow down to them. You shall not pray to them. And she acted like she had never heard that before in a day in her life. And what a shame that a church that they claim is built upon Jesus Christ himself knows very little about the real Jesus Christ. Um, I am going to... Um, Make some notes sometime. In fact, I'll throw them in as part of this Beast series. And we're going to talk about that today. Uh, uh, notes about the idle shepherd. 
and I was uh, out doing some chores this last weekend, and it occurred to me that and doing chores is good for you, okay? Because you read the Bible, and then while you're out working, you're supposed to think about what you read. And some of the greatest thoughts that God's ever give, given me has been usually early in the morning or while I'm out doing something. And um, But anyway, it occurred to me that the, the Catholic popes carry around this staff in their hand. And in some cases, it's, it's a shepherd's crook or it is that bent cross that bent cross with that mangled whatever that is on there but it's a shepherd's crook is what it is and he the pope is an idle shepherd not the idle shepherd an idle shepherd and i say that um i have been criticized by people and and you know i, I don't mind the criticism Nobody, nobody stands above being criticized, especially me. Um, but I've been criticized because somebody said I was soft on Roman Catholicism because I won't declare the Pope the beast. He's not. He is a placeholder. His throne is a placeholder throne for the Antichrist, but he is not the Antichrist. He is an Antichrist. Just like the Worshipful Master in the Masonic Lodge is also a placeholder for the Antichrist. Both of them are part and parcel of who this beast is going to be. So, no, I do not believe that Pope Francis, I do not did not believe that Pope John Paul II, John Paul I, Pope Paul, Pope John, I do not believe that these men are the man of sin, the son of perdition. They are a placeholder for this particular beast and he is coming and when he does the catholic church the mormon church the uh buddhist temples the the uh islamic whatever it is they worship in all of those organizations are going to join together and in fact joining together uh, they're going to join together and they're going to bow before the one who is the beast. Speaking of joining together, article comes out last week um, of something that I've been talking about. Others have been talking about as well. But we're within a few years now of that technology being in place. A future human brain slash cloud interface will give people instant access to vast knowledge via thought alone. Now, let me get on my UFO weirdness thing a little bit. Uh, and I th and I believe that this is biblical. What I'm going to share with you. Um, I just watch a testimony of a young man who was a Marine, was stationed at a um, facility down in, where was it, Peru? Let's see if I can find the video real quick. I have it pulled, yeah, it's in Peru. And he said that a UFO crashed in Peru. And him and a couple other guys from the base went out there to see the crashed UFO. The thing was like crashed into the side of a mountain. And he said that inside of this ET craft, um, this he said the thing didn't have any knobs or buttons or joysticks or controls or anything like that because the craft was piloted by means of thought. So they didn't need, you know, a, a yoke or they didn't need a, a joystick or they didn't need a steering wheel and foot pedals and to control the, uh, the aeronautics, as it were, of the craft. It was controlled by thought. Now, Ezekiel chapter 1 tells us 
about how the chariot of God moves back and forth is that it is controlled by the living creatures because the Bible says that the, the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. And so wherever the living creatures wanted to go, they just simply had to express their will somehow, some way, and that chariot went exactly where the living creatures wanted it to go. Now, if you think that this is all craziness and you're not going to listen to sit here and listen to this kind of garbage, let me explain something to you. We, we may be within 20 years of a human brain computer interface. We're closer than that to a fully automated automobile that will be controlled by human will without human hands guiding it. It will be controlled that way. It's already being worked on. We're developing smart cars and we get in these smart cars. We can use our mobile device and, you know, punch in the coordinates uh, or the, the address or wherever, or just simply, you know, I'm still not there yet. I'm not used to talking to a computer. I'm used to talking through a computer, but not to a computer. And I grew up watching Star Trek, and on, Star on the Enterprise, they say computer. And the computer goes, Brrr! and Captain Kirk says, uh, you know, give me the location of Commander Spock. Commander Spock is on deck 13. So I'm not there yet. People are getting Alexa, they're getting, you know, Siri, and they're getting uh, Cortana, and they're getting Google Home or whatever. They're getting all these devices that they give the commands to, they speak to them, and then the computer does whatever it is. That, you know, computer, bring the lights down, the house down 50%. I, for some reason, I just, I just don't like that. I don't feel comfortable with it. I'm not saying it's wrong or it's sinful. I'm just saying I'm just not there. But we're building the cars now. Not prototypes, the, the things where people are going to get in them and they're going to say, take me home. I mean, already my phone, when I get in my car today to go wherever it is I go, my phone knows at a certain time of day, if I get in the car, it knows where I'm going. It's learned me. It even knows on certain days that if I get in the car at the same time on this particular day, I'm not going home first. I'm going somewhere else. It knows that. And so, I mean, we already have the technology that is working along with our patterns and our habits and our will. So it does not surprise me at all that this guy saying, I'm a, I'm a, I'm I love my country. I'm a patriot. I believe in the Constitution. And I'm telling you that I know this ET craft was operated by the will of these aliens. They had to, they thought to control the craft and it did exactly. So that's technology that supposedly is a thousand years in advance of us, but we're already working on that technology and making it work now. So this article comes out and it's talking about the human brain computer interface. Imagine a future technology that will provide instant access to the world's knowledge and artificial intelligence simply by thinking about a specific topic or question. Communications, education, work, and the world we know it would be transformed. Um, there is an article in a, let's see, Frontiers in Neuroscience called human brain slash cloud interface that connects brain cells to vast cloud computing networks in real time. Now, I'm not going to read all of this article, but there was, I dealt with this uh, a couple times a few years ago. 
um, on watching one broadcast, and I, I think I've dealt with it on Pastor Mike Online. There was a, a guy that did a TED Talk, and it was called The First 500 Days of the Next 500 Days of the Internet. And what he did was he, he said, we have been, we're now into 500, was it, no, it couldn't be 500 days. It wasn't 500 years, I know that. But anyway, it may be 5,000 days. Maybe it, was, maybe it was that. But he was talking about how the Internet had grown from its early inception when the World Wide Web first became public, you know, in the mid-90s. And everybody had this idea of how it was going to be. And it's like somewhat different than what they thought it was going to be. So he's projecting out now about the next 5,000 days of the Internet, the World Wide Web. <clears throat> and he basically said that the web and the human mind are going to be one. That a new species was going to evolve a man that had a brain connection to the World Wide Web. And he said, essentially, there's going to be one operating system. Operating system is like Windows, Linux, or Mac. Think the set of instructions that make the computer do what it does. And he said, essentially... At that day, there's going to be one operating system. It's going to control everything, including all of the people that are hooked up to it. Now, what I believe is going to happen is hooking into the brain slash computer interface is going to start out voluntary and end up mandatory. But... Mandatory in such a way as you won't have to make everybody link up to it. They'll want to do that. Now, I'm just going to I'm going to run through some scenarios and I'm going to keep this PG rated. Number one, yes, you will have access to basically all of the world's information. You will be able to speak any language in the world, which is a reversal of Genesis 11, right? Remember the theme of Genesis 11 was the whole earth was of one language and of one speech, one, one, one. The whole earth, one, one language, one speech. And everybody was one, gathered together. God scattered them, split their languages up, gave them different accents, split them up by Family split them up by language and then split them up by geography. In the days of Peleg was the earth divided. So when God scattered everybody, he scattered everybody. So let's bring everybody back together again. And the way to do that, instead of making English the mandatory language, let's just hook them up to a computer to where man will surpass languages. They will surpass language. They, their minds will be linked in to this operating system. You will have in, instant access to just about any piece of, well, with the exception of a Bible, you will have instant access to any piece of information that you want. That's a God. You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Along with this, then, will be the promise that we will be able to uh, save a copy of your consciousness so that if your body dies will resurrect you because your old self will be stored in the cloud. This is why we don't lose documents anymore. When we have a computer malfunction or a hard drive goes out, we don't have to lose all of our files anymore because we've gotten used to storing them in a cloud. Whether you use iCloud or Google or Dropbox or, you know, here's Microsoft. You know what Microsoft calls their cloud? One drive. One. Everything's going to be one. Everybody's going to be equal. Everybody's going to be the same. It's like the ultimate form of communism. Everybody 
and every religion is going to be exactly the same. There's that's this is why when this happens, there will be no such thing as more than one country on the earth. There would be no such thing as that. Everybody, they will eliminate every border of every single nation in this world when they hook everybody up. Because then they will be controlled by the machine. That God, that leader, instead of a president or a king or a prime minister or a dictator, they will be controlled by the operating system itself. You'll have you'll be able to shop for whatever you want instantly. No need for credit card, no need for that because you won't have to pull out a card. Oh, I I lost my card. It was stolen and somebody's going to steal all of my money. Well, there'll be no need for that. Because your brain linked to the collective and I suspect by then, well, I don't think you'll be able to get whatever you want for free because I think the love of money is the root of all evil and I think commerce is still going on. But you understand that in that day, you won't be able to buy or sell except you become part of that collective, connecting your brain to the World Wide Web. So shopping, get what you want just like that, okay? Uh, you'll be able to work from home. You'll be able to work from anywhere. And along with this, now, I'm hearing some things about the 5G networks. I'm not sure what I believe on that yet, so I'm not going to say anything yet. But absolutely, I believe that when they finally start hooking everybody's brains up to the collective interface there will have to be a very high-speed wireless communications uh, network in place. It'll have to be there. So 5G is coming. Whether you like it or not, it's coming. And there's nothing going to stop it. Nothing. It's going to happen. Because that's how they're going to hook everybody up. you got to have a very, very fast, high-speed broadband Wireless access, no matter where you go on this earth, and that's what 5G and maybe even 6G is all about. I don't know. But anyway, that's what that's all about. But then, here comes the, the PG part. You, you kind of know where I'm going with this, right? Um, you'll, be able to, you'll be able to watch any movie you want. Then I don't mean like on your TV. You'll be able to watch it. In the window of your mind, you'll be able to listen to not people listen to nonstop music anyway. They have the earbuds in the ears all the time, the wireless earbuds now. People listen to music all the time. The nature of pornography is going to be such that it is going to be immersive. You're not just going to see the movies. You're going to be in the scenes because of this. Listen, your Bible's right. Babylon, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's get our scriptures out. Babylon is a golden cup in God's hands, and she has a cup full of filthiness. And God uses her to make the nations mad. And the word mad in the King James doesn't mean angry. It means crazy, out of their heads, out of their minds. You do not, you will not have control over your own thoughts. You won't have that control. Revelation 17, the woman, in verse 4, was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And literally, literally, everybody, everybody 
is going to be a fornicator. Everybody is. It's going to, it, the lust of the flesh, the term lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes right now, I don't think we, I don't think we can even fathom how bad it's going to get. There was a movie that came out um, in the 80s called Brainstorm. And the scientists were developing this brain interface where somebody put on a headset and they recorded all of their, what their eyes could see, what their ears could hear, what all of their senses could feel and what was going on in their brain at the time it was being recorded. And then another person put on a headset and that could be played back to them and they would see, hear, feel, taste, smell, touch, experience what the other person experienced on the recording. And there was a guy that looped this little affair thing on this tape and he just basically blotted out the whole world and looped this back in his mind time after time after time after time. And I'm telling you, science fiction becomes science fact. And when, when we already know that the internet is bad enough, the exact way it is right this second, we already know that it's bad enough. So imagine then, you know, please don't imagine too much, the day when someone's mind gets plugged into the internet or the cloud. What do you think? What do you think a majority of people, male and female, their first hour are going to do with it? What do you think? Think they're going to play Jeopardy? Watch cat videos? No. Okay? And I'm just telling you, you're talking about turning everybody into the same person. Literally one mind. Control from the top down, which is what you have with the papacy. It's what you have with Freemasonry. In Freemasonry, you have the worshipful master. And everybody in the lodge submits to that throne voluntarily. Or you're not allowed into the lodge if you don't do that. Same way in Roman Catholicism. You submit voluntarily. And some people, again, some people have had in their mind that, you know, people's going to have to take the mark by being, you know, threatened at gunpoint. And we'll shoot all your children if you don't take this mark. I'm telling you, people are going to do it voluntarily. Revelation 13, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them that dwell on the earth to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He didn't force them to, he caused them to. And they did it voluntarily. He created the cause by which they worshiped the beast and they did it. Just like in the Garden of Eden. The cause was, see that fruit over there? Boy, it doesn't look nice. Wouldn't it make you wise? You'd be as gods, knowing good and evil. What Eve did, Eve was voluntary. She had a choice. She made the wrong one. The devil didn't make her do it. She did what she wanted to do. It was the devil's job to pull this lust out of her because it was there already. Um, and then verse... Verse 16, he causeth all. Again, he's causing everybody to worship the beast, and he's causing everybody to receive a mark. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name or the uh, of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. For those of you who do not know, I have a website. I have more than one website. But I have a website called 666alert.net. Here is the latest. 
This came in today from Donna, the software lady. Donna, we love you. Could you hear it? Anyway, uh, she saw this. Look, look at here. I, and I literally did this. When Donna sent me the email and I looked at it, I went, holy cow. I, I did that out loud. Of course, there's nobody here. But look at this. Look at the triple sixes here. Business conferences, right? 666, 666, 666. Region 4, Region 3. I wonder how many, I wonder if there's 10 regions there. It'd be interesting to find out. Look at this one. My wife is in on it now. She's helping, she, she knows every time we go somewhere, I see new ones. So she saw this flipping through a magazine sent it and sent it to me. And I'm going, you're turning into me, sweetie bye. Notice the hexagons. Um, let me pull that one up. There's a movie called uh, UFO. See that? See it right there? Dun, dun, dun. The, the claws on the little paw back there in the background. Uh, look at this one. Right, there's hexagons here, here. Seemed like there's another one in there somewhere. Hive mentality, see the hexagons here, right there, 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 there. Uh, let's look at a couple more, older post. There, see them? See the sixes? Yankee Stadium, a guy sent me this. It's an old uh, photograph of Yankee Stadium. See the sixes on the bottom? There, the Polydent commercial. This is a TV commercial. And there's three of them together right here. Um, let's see, what is this one? Oh, this is like a little beach tent you get. I titled it The Sand of the Sea. There's... There, uh, Rockstar Energy Drink. See the three hexagons here? And then, I think Donna sent me this one too. 10 terabytes of storage. See the hexagon here? There it is there. Check this out. Doesn't that look freaky? Look at that. One, two, three, four, five, six on his right hand. See that force link. Uh, there's four of them together. By the way, I call it little donkey. The word burrito. Burro means donkey. A, an ito at the end of a Spanish word means little one. Little donkey. That's what a burrito is. A little donkey. So why do they call it that? Because donkeys are or burrows are beasts of burden. You take everything you've got and you pack it onto a burrow. And that's the idea behind a burrito. You take all this stuff, leftover food, and you stick it in this flatbread, tortilla, all right? So anyway, 666alert.net. If you see anything like that, send it to me, pastormikeonline at gmail.com. And if you send it to me and I don't acknowledge... Then send it to me again, all right? All right, now, back of the ranch. Let me read another story to you here, and then we'll talk about the beast as a lion. Where is the story? Here we go. I have been telling everybody this, and we're there now. As far as genetic manipulation is concerned, you know, let me give you my, my rundown of what I believe that the mark of the beast I don't think we really know what it is yet now I know everybody back in the 80s everybody was saying it was the barcode universal product code okay and you know I can kind of see that um, but see that was the new technology back then and then we could see back then in the 70s and 80s that everything was being labeled with that. And so, okay, that's, that could be it. The universal product code could be part of the mark of the beast. Then the 
in the 90s, the radio frequency ID chip came out. So everybody's saying, ah, RFID, that's the mark of the beast right there. And then people were saying that the RFID chip became mandatory under Obamacare. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. I don't have my RFID chip, do you? No, we don't have that. And I'm not going to get into what was in Obamacare. What I'm going to tell you is the RFID chip and the universal product code are the progenitors of the mark of the beast. In other words, they are the forerunners. They are just like the, the Pope's throne or the Worshipful Master's throne are the placeholders for the beast, the product code, and the RFID chip. They are the placeholders for the mark of the beast. The technology is going to be part of that. The product code is a way of identifying things or people. RFID chip, a way of knowing their whereabouts. Okay? But just getting a chip with a radio frequency coming out of it does not that does not take over your will. That does not take over your 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 brain, your conscious. It does not take it does not turn you into a zombie. There are people, there are people who work in companies who have those embedded under their skin and they still have free choice. They still have free will. So it doesn't do what some people thought it would do. It does it's not doing that. So but what I'm saying is it's yeah, it's a way of knowing where everybody is. The product code is a way of identifying people. But I think also we must take into consideration number one the brain computer interface which that article said within the next 10 to 20 years we're going to have it and once it's there we're not going to we're not going to ever uninvent technology once it's there it will be used no doubt about it it and think about it i mean there's already this thing in society where the people who think they are smarter than everybody else are the ones who rule over everybody else, right? I mean, we like to kid ourselves and think this is still the government of the people, by the people, and for the people, but it's not. It's the government of the elite ruling over the people. And I hate that. I hate that idea. But as America turns themselves more over to sin, that's the byproduct of it. You gotta lose freedoms. So we already know that the people who think they're smarter than everybody and have more knowledge and are more intelligent than everybody else, that they are the ones who have the right to rule everybody else because everybody else is too stupid to rule themselves. So what do you think is going to happen on the day that these elite start plugging themselves into the system where they have instantaneous access to every piece of information that can be available? They are going to be the ruling class. And everybody that joins in, all of a sudden now, those who have are going to be against those who have not. And if you want to survive, you'll join in with them. Because if you don't join in with them, they're already so arrogant because their lift knowledge puffeth up, the Bible says, like leaven. And because, boy, just think about that verse, knowledge puffeth up. And when these people get their brains hacked into the system, they're going to be full of knowledge. And it's going to make them so arrogant over everybody that's not hooked in, which would be me, that they'll think that they'll have a right to imprison me or a right to rule over me or a right to kill me. Because I'm not hooked in. It's like, it's like the, um, it's like the, um, uh, what is it? The, the, the inoculations. They inoculate everybody in America. Then your child shows up to school who hasn't been inoculated. And all of a sudden, he is a serious threat to the security of the United States of America. 
and we need to quarantine him, and we need to we need to arrest his parents because he did wasn't given his vaccinations, and he's a threat. Well, if they've already been, if everybody else has been vaccinated and they can't catch the disease, then why is my son or daughter a threat to your child if he can't catch the disease? But see, that's how people think. If you don't go along with their flow, if you don't go along with their system, well, you're a you're a dangerous person. And uh, so those of you, those of you parents who have not vaccinated your children and you don't really feel led to, I'm not ever going to tell you you have to do it. I keep standing against some of that stuff. Amen. Now, um, what was it? Oh, anyway. So number one, technology linking the human mind into the collective. That's going to be part of it. Mark of the Beast. The second thing is genetics. Now think about that mark. John said, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. Both together. What, what is it that makes the difference between beast and man? It's DNA. And what that DNA does. What what difference is there between humans and chimpanzees as far as genetics is concerned? A 3% difference. That's it. A 3% difference in DNA between a human and a chimpanzee. But look at the difference that 3% makes. Chimpanzees are pretty smart. But they're not smart enough to do algebra. They're not smart enough to write poetry. They're not smart enough to, um, let's see. They're not smart enough to write an autobiography. Because an autobiography means that you have the ability to think of where you fit in in this universe. Chimpanzees are smart, but they're not that intelligent. They don't ha they don't possess that self awareness of where they fit in in the universe. They don't have they don't have that idea that concept. Humans do, and free will. We have choice. We have free will. Chimpanzees are beasts. They don't possess that. So God gives that exclusively to humans. But there's there, any good dictatorship will tell you if we could just take away the will of the people, we'd have it made, right? Well, that's what's going to happen. And the mark of the beast is not just going to be a tattoo. It's not just going to be a radio frequency um, geolocation marker. It's going to be something that is going to eliminate their free will, their ability to say no. That's what it's going to be. We're already in that time. So there's an article. Three parent babies. Mother of three parent DNA baby praises new fertility treatment. The Greek mother of the first baby born using DNA from three people. On Friday, praised the revolutionary technique that helped her conceive and thanked the mystery woman who donated the egg. Under the terms of the treatment, she was not allowed to meet the donor, uh, but she had a message for the woman whose donation allowed her to finally have a child. I would like to thank her very much, she told the Athens Mac Macedonian News Agency. She is one of the many people that helped us to make, helped to make me happy. I will never be able to forget her, even though I do not know her. I wish her all the best. A team of Greek and Spanish doctors helped her give birth to a baby boy Tuesday using a new in vitro fertilization technique they call the material spindle transfer method uh, in Athens. The team used an egg from the infertile mother, the father's seed, and the, another woman's egg to conceive the baby boy, transferring genetic material, uh, material with the chromosomes from the mother to the egg of a donor whose genetic material had been removed. One dad, two moms. Sounds like a liberal library book. 
that's the world we're living in. Multiple parents. And I've said this before, the idea that the beast in Revelation 17 is the eighth and is of the seven. Now, to me, it makes a little bit better sense. He's not one of the seven. He is of the seven. All seven. A child now can be born having three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, a dozen different genetic parents. The sky's the limit on this one. But we're into the age now where we're actually producing humans that I believe are an abomination to God. Because in Genesis 6, by the time Noah gets to building the ark, or even before that, God has already said of this world, I wish I'd never made it. It repented God that he had made man on the earth because all flesh had corrupted itself. All flesh. And I, I'm just now realizing that I'm not online. So I'm going to, those of you watching this later, you'll know. I, I had this problem before we started Pastor Mike Online. Problems with the internet. We've had it before where literally five minutes before it's time to start, internet goes out. It's worked all morning up until 12 o'clock. So anyway, I'm going to continue on. Let's talk about La Beast. Uh, let me switch over here. Speaking of beast, he is a lion. I covered a little bit of this a couple weeks ago, but I want to start at this point and move forward. The beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. Four, four different creatures here. You have the leopard, you have the bear, you have the lion, and the dragon together. Making up this, it's like that he's the fourth kingdom. You have four beasts. He's the, the, the fourth beast in Daniel 7 is the fourth kingdom of Daniel chapter 2. Uh, let me get to, let's see if I can find it here where we left off. Yeah, I, and I talked about this. We have the Lion of the tribe of Judah, who is Christ. But then you have the Roaring Lion, which is the devil. And how do you tell the difference between the Lion of Judah and the devil? Peter said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And I think the key here is to be sober. Because if you're drunk, you won't know the difference. It's like, and there's more than one story about this. A drunk man ending up in bed with another woman because he didn't know that that wasn't his wife. There's actually a story in the Bible about this. And it is Jacob. Because Jacob arranged to work seven years for Rachel. On the night of their wedding. They feasted, they drank, and Laban said, uh, I'm not giving Rachel up, I'm going to give her ugly sister up, the older sister, firstborn. So Laban arranged for the women to be switched. Jacob is so drunk, he doesn't know the difference. So he ends up with the wrong 
woman doesn't realize the mistake until the next morning. And then it's too late. Laban said, no, it's not our custom to give, you know, the youngest daughter first. And, you know, Jacob could have said, well, should have said that seven years ago. Okay. But drunkenness, remember Babylon's got a cup in her hand. That drunkenness comes from not knowing what the word of God actually says. When you don't know the Bible, you don't know what the Bible says, like most church people and most people in the world for that matter, but most church people do not know enough of the Bible to be able to tell the difference between the real Jesus and the phony Jesus. And that's deliberate. It's done deliberately. It's a setup. All the what do you think? All these fake Bibles are there just to, you know, for the devil to have a, have a good laugh. Ah, I tricked you. That's not the real Bible. Here's the real Bible here. No, it's it's a well thought out, well prepared vine of Sodom deception. So that people will drink from the vine of Sodom and be drunk with the poison of dragons, and then the fake Christ, the counterfeit, shows up, and people cannot tell that that's not really Jesus. And they're going to fall for it. They're going to be deceived by it. Hosea. Let me show you Hosea uh, 13. And it actually, Hosea 13 mentions those four beasts. Or actually three of them. But it's an interesting uh, thing that God says here. Let me see if I can find it here. Hosea, 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 where you are, Hosea, right there after Daniel. Hosea 13, God said, verse 7, Therefore I will be unto them as a lion, as a leopard by the way will I observe them. I will meet them as a bear that is bereaved of her whelps, and will rend the call of their heart, and there will I devour them like a lion. The wild beast shall tear them. Notice that it's God saying, I will be unto them as a lion. I will be unto them as a leopard. I will be unto them as a bear. I will be unto them. In other words, they think they're worshiping me, but they're not worshiping me. They're worshiping a beast. And I am not a beast. Because they didn't want to know the truth, because they only want to be lied to, God said, fine, there's enough devils that'll tell you the lies. I don't have to, and I don't lie. But you definitely don't want to hear the truth, so I'm not going to speak the truth to you. I'm not even going to tell you what the truth is. I'm just going to send this spirit here, and this spirit is in this new Bible that you bought. This spirit is, is in this church that you went to. You left the old church because you didn't like the preacher getting on to you for your tattoos. You said, I don't have to listen to that. Ah, uh, the preacher won't let me keep my beer in my refrigerator. Ah, uh, he's one of them preachers who says rock and roll's wrong. You know, my nephew, Jimmy, he's a sodomite. There ain't nothing wrong with that. He loves somebody. Why can't he go to heaven? I don't like that preacher. So they go to find this other church. And so they're drinking the wine, the vine of Sodom, and they're getting spiritually drunk. So then the lion comes along and... Their pastor said that's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Not the bad lion, it's the good lion. And they think that they're worshiping God, but they're not. Remember Satan said, I will be like who? Buddha? No. Joseph Smith? No. Muhammad? No. I will be like the Most High. And God's going to allow that. Um. So... Aslan, C.S. Lewis, writing about, and he's even died and resurrected. And now because of his magic powers, he can make people live again. C.S. Lewis, I'm t and I used to read C.S. Lewis when I was in high school. He was not right in what he was saying. He was trying to teach truth by using myth. And you can't do that. Joel chapter 1. Now this is, this is who the beast is related to. 
a nation. Joel chapter 1 is come up upon my land strong and without number. Whose teeth are the teeth of a lion and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. And that's Joel's army mentioned in Revelation 9.17. I thus saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them. Because if you look in Joel chapter 2, you have some more of the same description along with Joel 1 that you find in Revelation 9. I saw Thus I saw the horses in the vision and them sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions. Out of the mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. Think about it. What came out of their mouth? Fire and smoke and brimstone. Um, whereas out of the mouth of the lion of the tribe of Judah comes the words of God. Out of the mouths of these devils come smoke and brimstone and fire. A wrath fire instead of an illuminating fire. That's the difference. Now, uh, judges, I covered that. I covered 1 Samuel 17 about Goliath. Yeah, look at this. Second, Second Samuel twenty three twenty. These are David's mighty men, the men that accompanied David, helped him win all of his battles. You know, David was a fierce warrior. But as he got older, he had to. In fact, his captain came to him and said, "David, uh, we can't afford to let the light of the Israel go out." And I know you want to be on the front line of every battle, but we need you. All these men here in your army, any one of them be willing to give their life, lay down their life willingly for you, David. So we're going to we're going to ask you to step back because all of us can fight but only one of us can lead. A lot of wisdom in that. So David did. But he had mighty men. Jehoiada, Benaiah. Um, yeah, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel. He slew two lion-like men of Moab. Now, first time I saw him. What does that even mean? Lion like lion like men of Moab. And he slew a lion in the midst of a pit in time of snow. Now that I get, because where's the beast come from? It comes up out of the pit. But who are these two lion like men? Now it has been theorized by more than one person, meaning theorized by more than just me, that these two lion-like men, in other words, you can see it as, number one, a symbolic adjective. Whoa, those men, they were like lions coming at us. I mean, you could see it like that. But then, not literally lions. You can see it that way. And if you do, I mean, that's, yeah, that's fine. Because I'm not sure just how literal this phrase is. But let's, let's think about it for a minute. Um, is it? I'll say it like this. Was it possible a hundred years ago that a man could have lion DNA in him? No. Is it possible now? Yes. But then a more relevant question is, 
was it possible 3,000 years ago? Because that's David. Was it possible 3,000 years ago that there could have been living in the time of David men who had a strange type of DNA in them. Yes. In fact, let me go back. 1 Samuel 17, 36. Spoken of Goliath, thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. Now, we know that Goliath was, yeah, Goliath was of the mingled seed. That his father, his father's father, and his father's father's father, and maybe even his great-great-great-grandfather was a giant. At some point, then, Goliath's great-great-great-grandfather would have been an angel, a beast. Now, uh, remember what we saw in Ezekiel 1, that the four living creatures, they have four faces. And one of their faces is that of, let's see here, we have uh, the man, and the second one is a lion. So we know then that it's possible that an angelic being having the appearance and the body and the nature of a lion. We know it. We also know that the sons of God came into the daughters of men and children were born unto these daughters of men. We know that this was a celestial father and a terrestrial mother and they both have seed if satan himself is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour then we have multiple places in the bible that refer to thou child of the devil so getting back to these two lion-like men is it possible three thousand years ago that these men could have had lion DNA as part of their genetic makeup. I wouldn't think earthly lion, no. I'm thinking spirit lions. Evil angels that are lion in their makeup, their, their behavior, their nature, and their appearance. Now, take a look at that. What do you have? I mean, think about that. Dun, dun, dun. While you look at that, I'm going to see if I can get streaming back on again. Hang on a second. Pause. Now, let me try that. I got that one. That one's Sermon Audio. Now, see if I can get Facebook. Nope. All right. We'll just do sermon audio for today. And be glad we got it. In Greek tradition, and remember, the mythologies the traditions, the old stories, they're the fossilized remains of biblical truth. You can see truth in myths, stories about giants, stories about griffins, right? But the only truth that we believe is the word of God. So in Greek tradition, the Sphinx has the head of a human, the haunches of a lion, and sometimes the wings of a bird. 
it is mythicized as treacherous and merciless. Think about that. Let's go back to this verse here. That Benaiah killed two lion-like men. Well, these lion-like men are treacherous and merciless. Those who cannot answer its riddle suffer a fate typical in such mythological stories as they are killed and eaten by this ravenous monster. You remember the movie, um, it was an 80s movie, um, The Never-Ending Story. You remember Atreyu, he's, uh, he's, on a, he's on a quest and he's got to go past the oracle. And the oracle are these two female human lions, these sphinxes. And he's got he's to gotta pass some sort of test in order to get past them or they'll kill him. Right? You remember that? That's where that comes from. Um, this deadly version of a sphinx appears in the myth and drama of Oedipus. Unlike the Greek sphinx, which was a woman, the Egyptian sphinx is typically shown as a man or an andro sphinx. In addition, the Egyptian sphinx was viewed as benevolent, but having a ferocious strength similar to the malevolent Greek version, and both were thought of as guardians often flanking the entrances to temples. Think about that for a minute. What is it that stands as a guardian over the great pyramid of Egypt? The Sphinx. It is the body of a lion, the crown or like the head partially of a lion, but the face of a man. Standing guard over it and hiding its secrets. We can't tell you the truth about what this means, right? There's some more there. Uh, even right here, if I get my pen out here. This, whereas like this would be a Greek version because those are females. This here is the Chinese version of it. There's, there is a sphinx in just about every culture in the world. Imagine that. There's giants and a flood story as well. And there's a sphinx. You know, think about the David's mighty men killing two lion-like men. Is the Bible being literal in, in its account that these men were not just mere humans that were mean? Were they, in fact, half man, half lion? Were they that? It's biblically, both are possible. Either they were just mean men and, you know, Benaiah killed them both or they were mingled species, part human, part lion, and Benaiah killed them. Either way, he goes down. He gets the credit in the Bible for being one of David's mighty men. This is the civil courts building in downtown St. Louis, Missouri. Let me hit the music. Dun, dun, dun. It is um, the St. Louis Civil Courts building. Uh, it's where a lot of trials are held. I've been in this building. And uh, if you go to a Cardinals baseball game, you can see this from the stadium. I've taken several pictures of it. The meaning of this particular building with the step pyramid on the top and the Greek temple below it. This sits at the roof. Uh, and and most people in the St. Louis area, we've seen this. Most people have no idea what that means. They have no clue. In fact, there was a local news reporter uh, on the Fox affiliate in, in the St. Louis area. Used to do a, um, a weekend series called What Is It? And he'd go around the, you know St. Louis and he would talk about various landmarks and things where people would scratch their head and go, I have no idea what this is. Well, I happened to catch it where he talked about the St. Louis Civil Courts building. 
And he went around asking people, you've seen that building, right? Yeah, with the you know pyramid on and stuff like that. You know what that means? No, I have no idea what that means. And the reporter, I mean, he did a little homework on it. He didn't have a clue. He had no clue what this was. It was actually a Masonic emblem. Now, consider this. This is the civil courts building. This is the building where trials of men and women are held, holding men's fates in the balance and ruling over that. This is the spirit of Antichrist in the, in the form of Freemasonry. Uh, and I am I am 100% convinced that the judicial process in this country is probably in many places, not all, but many places, just as corrupt as any third world dictatorship you would find. Corrupt. Anyway. The uh, Greek temple on the bottom represents the earth. The step pyramid on the top represents the heavens. And they're joined together. Now, what we just read was um, these sphinxes, these lion-like men, were thought of as guardians often flanking the entrances, entrances to temples. Do you see it? In other words, they possess a secret. They represent a secret. They represent a secret doctrine, but not just a secret religious doctrine, a secret political doctrine. And that is, and by the way, um, if you look here, well, actually, you can see it here as well. Uh, you can tell the sun shining on one part. Um, one faces east and one faces west. They're opposites. They're both um, sphinxes. Face of a man, wings of of an eagle, body of a lion. And so they represent opposites, the fusion of opposites, north and south, east and west, fused together, yin and yang, daylight and dark, temple of God, temple of Baal, light and darkness, good and evil, yin and yang, male and female, sons of God, daughters of men. That's what that represents. And, it, and it's the it's the possessor of a secret and of a secret doctrine. And in this case, it represents the king, the spirit of the king that rules over the things that go on in that courthouse. And it's basically a picture of the Antichrist, the emblem of the Antichrist, who is a beast and yet he is a man simultaneously. He's just ponder that then because in the age so let's say now with now that we live in the day of three parent babies would it be possible that a child could have a human father a human mother and a lion father is it possible absolutely Absolutely. It had just, since we already know how to do CRISPR, just take a matter of time to figure out how to make it work and how to make it work right. So you cannot tell me, there's no way in the world I'm going to believe that there is no laboratory anywhere, no facility anywhere on the earth where they are not already making beast-human hybrids. You'll never convince me of that. And I don't have to go to any of them and take pictures and bring them back and put them on the Internet to know that these things are in existence. Because I already, I mean, I, I, I say I already know. It's not like I've been to any of them. 
but I know scientists. Now that they have the ability to use CRISPR to augment DNA at will and cheaply, it's being done. Now, we would like to think that it's being done in China and Russia and North Korea and, the, you know, a rogue, maybe in Iran. But America's the good guys. We would never do that. I would say, yes, it's probably being done. Either with civilian cooperation or no civilian cooperation, it's being done. And we're about to become, and I say we, I'm talking about the world, about to become a, a nation of beasts. There's the, uh, the Thailand version of it. Two lion bodies with one human face head. Okay. So whether you have the form of one body with two heads or one head and two bodies, you're still dealing with the same concept. You're dealing with the fusion of opposites thrust together, fused together to make the ultimate form of confusion. This is on, this is right out in front, the Masonic House of the Temple Lodge in Washington, D.C. And when I put these two pictures together, I never notice this. And I've been to this, and the it's called the House of the Temple Lodge for a reason. Remember, the Sphinxes are guardians to a temple. Whatever secrets are contained in that temple, whatever secret religion, whatever secret rituals are going on, whatever secret ceremonies, secret doctrines they have, the Sphinxes are the guardians to that. And sure enough, out in front of the Masonic House of the Temple Lodge, which is a temple... In Washington, D.C., you have two sphinxes. And I never noticed this, but I guess I should have guessed it. That one of the sphinxes, this one here, his eyes are closed. This one here, his eyes are open. So, now, it does not represent his eyes used to be blind, but now they're open. What it represents is his eyes are closed and open simultaneously. Now, how do you do that? Do you do it like, you know, like little children do? Because whenever you ask little children, okay, we're going to pray, now close your eyes. You know, they start out closing their eyes. And a split second when you start the prayer, you know they're all looking up going. Until they see you looking back and then they go. Right. Or this one. This is my favorite one. Papa. Journey had her eyes open during prayer. How do you know? I just thought it in my mind. I've heard that one. I've heard that one. OK. How do you have your eyes open and shut at the same time? For that matter, how can you be and not be at the same time? How can you be true and a myth simultaneously? How can you be and not be? How can you be dead and alive at the same time? It's impossible unless you're the beast. So he's a lion, all right. But he's going to be a man as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, on this one, he, let's see here, right here, you can see that he's got a globe of the stars in his hands. And here, that is South America, a globe of the Earth. So, I mean, you get that one, right? The stars are the heavens, and the land masses are the earth. One with its eyes open, one with its eyes closed. Yin and yang, male and female, light and darkness, heaven and earth, fused 
together, joined together. Daniel, describing the beasts that he sees in Daniel chapter 7. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. If we go back to, let's see here, that one. A lion with eagle's wings was the first beast that Daniel saw. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. Now, with that in mind, let me tell you what I think about that. Why, why is it a lion that has eagle's wings? Remember what uh, Jesus was telling us in the parable of the seed and the sower about uh, the when you sow the seed by the wayside, the fowls of the air came and devoured up, but then you find out that that fowl of the air is Satan himself or the devil. Okay. So the Bible's then telling you that if it has wings, it's a picture of a of a flying spirit, an angel of some kind. So Psalm eighty two. Once I, once I get on something, it's hard for me to get away from it. Psalm 82 was where God really showed me about how I can actually believe that chariots, angelic chariots, have fallen out of the sky and crashed on the earth. I can believe that. And these aliens that, you know, for all this time, I thought, well, they're, they're, they've got to be evil spirits. Well, I wasn't wrong. But I could not reconcile in my mind how then they could be killed. How could, they, how could they be dead alien bodies? These are, I mean, they're angels. Surely you would think that if they had the ability to travel through billions of light years in space, dodging aliens, every speck of you know meteorite in the universe why is it that they would come all the way to earth and then crash okay like they should have made that left turn at albuquerque or something like that why would they crash and it just didn't make sense to me until psalm 82 psalm 82 verse 6 i have said ye are gods and all of your children are the most high again Children of the Most High are sons of God. God is the Most High. That's his offspring. Children of the Most High are gods. Little g. But then he said, But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. So you have a flying lion. A lion that flies. The wings show you that he's a spirit. But then what happens when the wings get plucked off? It's just like if you had a butterfly or a fly and you pluck the wings off and then you toss it up in the air, what's it going to do? Crash. You took away. Now, that's what, that's what wings do. Wings give those creatures the ability to fly. When you take the wings off, You've taken away their ability to fly. And so this lion is one of the angelic beings, but then he has his wings taken off. And now he's stuck like gravity, like every other creature is down here. He's, he was a spirit. Now he's going to die like a man because his wings, his anti-gravity system, whatever, however you want to think about it, his ability to move through the air freely has been taken away from him. He is no longer what he used to be. Those things were plucked off and cast aside. And so, yeah, I do. I, I believe, I believe these, I believe these chariots been flying around in the air they should have stayed 
with, with their first estate up in heaven. They should have stayed there, but they didn't. So God said, fine, you want to play around down there? I'm going to make you like one of them. You want to mess with man? I'm going to make you like man. And so they fly into Earth's atmosphere, and sure enough, something happens, and it takes away their ability to fly through the air, and they crash. <laughs> Let's see, do I have a crash in here somewhere? Yeah, yeah that's close. Anyway. So that's what I think with this first beast that Daniel sees in Daniel 7. The first was like a lion, had an eagle's wings, and I beheld till the wings were there were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. All right. Oh, I got, this is my story. This is, this is where I was headed. This is where I was I was going to end up and how I was going to end up. There was a young prophet that God sent to the king. You can read all this story in 1 Kings 13. Um and when God told him he said you go to this king, you tell him what you're going to say and then you come back. I don't want you going any place else. I don't want you stopping anywhere else. I don't want you doing anything else. I want you to do what I say. So the young prophet left and he went to the king. He told the king what he had to say. Let's go to uh, first, first Kings 13 because I want to, I want to read this story to you the way it says it in scriptures. Let's uh, see, First Kings twenty-three, yeah, First Kings thirteen, because there is a there is such a tremendous story here, a warning to all of us preachers, guys, all of us preachers. We better do it God's way. Partial obedience is not obedience it's not now um verse 9 for so it was charged me by the word of the lord saying eat no bread nor drink water nor turn again by the same way that thou camest so he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to bethel so he did part of what god said part of what god said in verse 11, now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king, whom they had told also to their father. And their father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his son, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou... Uh, the man of God that came is from Judah. And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, come home with me and eat bread. The old prophet said to the young prophet, come home with me and eat bread. And he said, verse 16, I may not return with thee nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the way that... Um, by the word of the Lord, thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water therein nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. God told me, no, don't do it. So he said unto him, the old prophet, I'm a prophet also as thou art. You listen to this. This old prophet is about to barefaced lie to this young prophet. Now, I'm going to tell you, I spent three years in Bible college. The men that I sat under, I had a lot of love for. To this day, I do. But they just about killed me.
they convinced me that my Bible was wrong. When I first went to Bible college, I believe the King James Bible. Read a lot of the Chick publications material on it. Believed it. Then I went to Bible college. Then I'm told that my Bible has mistakes in it. Can't be relied on. And I believed them. And God could have, maybe should have, I'm glad he didn't, turn me over and had me killed. So the old prophet said, why don't you come to my house? I've got bread. In fact, my wife, whoo, man, she's a great cook. Got a comfy bed just for traveling preachers. Oh, no. God told me not to. And he says in verse 18, I'm a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spoke unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. Now, isn't it interesting that God himself told the young prophet exactly what he wanted him to do, but now an angel shows up according to the old prophet, and says something different. Where's all of our Mormon friends on this one? God sent himself to this world, Jesus Christ, the righteous, to deliver the truth of the word of God and to give men the gospel that'll save them. But then an angel shows up and says, Joseph Smith, all the churches have it wrong. I, and I'm here to, to restore the gospel. Restore the gospel. Give them a new way. A third testament. That's where the lion's going to show up, people. And all these young preachers, they get out of their home churches, and they've been taught to believe the Bible. Then they get into the Bible colleges and the seminaries. And then they start believing things that they never would have believed before. So an angel shows up and, and says to the old prophet, you go tell him that I said he can come to your house. Now we know the angel didn't do that, but that was the story that the old man came up with. This was a test. This was a test to the young prophet, will you listen strictly to God or not? I mean, you can imagine, he's probably tired, he's probably hungry, and he's probably thirsty. So to tempt a young preacher, food, water, shelter, the promises that are made to these young preachers that if they just go along to get along, that they'll be well-fed, well-housed, they'll be paid well, they'll have their insurance taken care of, they'll have benefits, they'll make a nice living. If you just don't tell us the truth of the Word of God, then we'll take good care of you, preacher. I fell for it. I'm a prophet as also thou art. And an angel spake unto me and by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back. Verse 19, So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. Now we're going to pick it up. Look at verse 20. And it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back back and hast eaten bread and drunk water in the place of the which the Lord did say to thee eat no bread and drink no water thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulchre of thy fathers you see this young prophet apparently only wanted to be deceived and God knew it 
God did not trick him. God did not fool him. And God certainly did not change his mind. It was a test. Like I get tested and like you get tested. And then we're going to face the ultimate test here before too long. Because that beast is going to show up. And he, I promise you, he's going to give out to everybody what it is that they always wanted all their life. Satisfaction in the flesh. You see, the old prophet could have even said, once you come back by my house, now I'm not going to feed you or give you anything to drink because God said no, but then the young prophet would have said, well, why would I want to go to your house then? If I make it home, I'll be able to eat and drink all I want to then. But he promised him a fulfillment of the desires of his flesh. That's what that bread and water means and that rest, that comfortable bed. That's what that all represents, people. The devil, you, you know the devil's in it. When he promises to fulfill the desires of your flesh as part of his religion, So, verse 23, it came to pass after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he saddled for him the ass to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. Killed that young prophet. And his carcass was cast in the way and the ass stood by it and the lion also stood by the carcass. You see, this lion was not interested. He didn't. You could say, well, you know, the lion came out because he was hungry. The lion didn't eat the guy. God just released the lion to kill him, and that was it. But he didn't eat him. Behold, men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way, and the lion standing by the carcass. And they came and told the city where the old prophet dwelt. And when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, it is the man of God who was disobedient unto the word of the Lord. Therefore the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion which had torn him and slain him according to the word of the Lord which he spake unto him. And that was me. As a young, young man. Deceived by the devil disobedient to God and God had every right to turn the lion loose to me to slay me he had the right and I'm sure it would have made the devil very happy but then there would have never been the talk show that hell hates There's usually not, and I won't say there's never a day that goes by, but there's usually not a day that goes by that I don't think back on those days and say, God, why did you keep me? Why did you preserve me? Why didn't you cast me away? You had a right to. Why didn't you do it? And there's some days I just struggle with the answer. You know, and, and I know the answer. It's God saying, because I love you. Well, that's what I struggle with. God, why do you love me? Why? And the truth of it is, he should have cast us all out, should have tossed us all away, but he didn't. Should have fed us all to the lions, but he hasn't, and he won't. And let that be an encouragement to you. Not only has God not turned us over to a reprobate mind, or not only has God not turned us over to the will of our enemies, not only has God not turned us over and had us destroyed by the destroyer, God's given us far greater than we could have ever, ever hoped for or ever imagined. God's a good God to us. Amen. Well, I'm going to pull out of here a little bit early today. 
we got weather moving in. It's going to change. It's already having its effect on me today. So with that, let me see if I can do that. There we go. It's been a joy talking to you today. I love you. Thank you, whoever sent this. Thank you. And you don't have to let me know who it was, because then God will bless you. Okay? I appreciate it. Uh, remember to pray for us. Remember to pray for our ministries. I started a new website last night. Not going to tell you what it is yet, because I don't have any. I don't have anything on it yet. But it's the one that I've been talking about, uh, dealing with mysterious creature sightings. People who have seen Mothman. Owl man. People who have seen dragons. People who have seen large, winged, humanoid creatures. People who have seen UFOs. People who have seen aliens. People who have seen Bigfoot. I believe you. I believe you. We have collected scores of stories already. Those are going to go on this website. Plus, uh, I, what I believe is a lot more. I had a man call me yesterday with a UFO story. I believe him. Said he was about 12, 13 years old when he saw this. And he doesn't talk about it because nobody, people think he's nuts. They think he's crazy. I believe you. And that's why I put the website up. Because I want you to know. I want you to have that one person in your life that believes that that you saw what you said you saw. So those of you that have already written in, I appreciate it. And your story is about to go, name withheld. It's about to go on our new website. When I get some of the content up, I'll let everybody know. It will have its own email address so that anybody who had, because I think there's a lot more out there, anybody who has a story of a sighting of some kind, We'll be able to send it in, and we'll get it posted to this website because I want people to be encouraged by this because I think people are going to see some weird, weird things. They're going to see a lot of it very, very soon. So once again, you are the reason why we do what we do. Now, I'm about to sign off, but I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. I've had to quit taking phone calls right after Pastor Mike Online. Uh, because, especially on days like this where I'm hurting, I want to go lay down. And I've had people, even after I say I need to go lay down, I've had people call. And it's not that I don't want to talk to people. There are other times to call. But people, I've been talking for two hours. Sometimes I have to go to bed. So call at a different time. I would love to spend time with you and talk to you. And I, you may have a story you want to tell me, and I want to get it down. But allow me some time after each Pastor Mike Online live broadcast to kind of rest myself. Will you do that? And again, I'm not trying to be mean about it. It's just that I'm human like everybody else. I've been talking for two hours, and I want to sit quiet for a while. All right? I love you. You are the reason why I do what I do. Never, ever, ever want to seem like I'm better than everybody else because I'm not. As long as we think Bible. Amen.